That was me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you, Norm. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, it's great to be here this morning. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see the room is uh, as full as it is. And uh, I hope you learned something here today. I, I do, every time I do this, I learn something. Uh, so hopefully that we all will do that as we go along. Uh, Norm, thank you as the representative and the chief of the NASA Alumni League for putting this on. And Ellen, for your help, the Knowledge Capture Group is doing the recording here today. We didn't have a Knowledge Capture <laughs> when we were doing this, and uh, maybe we should have. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, make a special note. Uh, Ken, Young, uh, Ken Young in the front here, if he stands up, you will really see him. Uh, uh, Ken was <laughs> Ken was one of the key players with the uh, mission planning organization, and uh, Ken, can you hear me now? Ken was one of the key players in the mission planning organization, and I wanted to take a special note of the effort that he put into starting this activity. If he hadn't recognized the reunion time or the anniversary time coming up. Uh, we wouldn't have had this event this morning. Uh, so, Ken, we want to thank you. Did you want to say something, Ken? Two is all you get. Kidding. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and i turn it over to our distinguished panel, which is a fantastic group of pioneers in the space industry, space world, not just rendezvous. But I thought I'd take one minute, if I could, to, to recognize those that are the real pioneers, just their names of, of the rendezvous, space rendezvous. Uh, one of whom is here today, Hal Beck. Believe it or not, Hal Beck and John Eggleston at Langley wrote the first technical note about rendezvous at Langley, I guess before, I don't see how right now, but before the, uh, uh, yeah, he he disappears. There he is. He and I are the long and short of it. <laughs> uh, anyway, he, they wrote a technical note at Langley on rendezvous, and that was pretty much the same time that John Hubolt at Langley was the real pusher behind lunar orbit rendezvous that enabled us to meet Kennedy's goal of putting man on the moon and bringing him back before 1970. And um, then three others I wanted to recognize, Howard Wild Bill Tyndall, who was along with Dr. Kraft, the best boss I ever worked for, Ed Lineberry, who I also worked for, he was a true rendezvous genius. Uh, and then Buzz Aldrin, who wasn't, isn't here today, but he was definitely one of the pioneers. So uh, I just wanted to give them recognition. And uh, then I had a whole list of impatters who worked rendezvous and flight crew ops people like Paul Kramer and such. But uh, it's too long to bother you with the names, but thank you all to the, those of us, and there are about 10 of them, I think, at least here uh, today to hear these panelists. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Ken. I, I, I will get on with the introductions of the people on the panel. I, I think you, most of you know uh, who they are, but let me do it alphabetically, uh, Frank. Uh, Borman has been a uh, mainstay of the program over the years. He was here for the Gemini 76 mission, which he patiently waited two weeks to uh, complete, uh, and he refers to himself as the target. Uh, the uh, dumb target. The, I won't say that, Frank. <laughs> he said dumb target. Um, uh, and then, of course, he went on and did a, a Gemini or a Apollo 8. And it's interesting, it was in, uh, both of these events were in December, and here we are in December, uh, but uh, the uh, 76 mission was in, December, was in December, and likewise Apollo 8, both magnificent missions. 
Uh, Frank left NASA about 1970. He got involved with Eastern Airlines, and it took him, boy, it took him a long time. It took him six years to become the chairman of the board, uh, and he worked there for another 10 years, and then he's gone on beyond that and is on the board of directors with a lot of companies, about six major companies today, uh, stays busy. Uh, his wife Susan back in Montana and uh, two boys uh, somewhere around the country, right, Frank? Uh, with that, uh, uh, let me also uh, do an introduction for Chris so that when they start to talk about this mission, they, they're not interrupted by me. Uh, everybody here probably is well acquainted with Chris and his uh, reputation. Uh, you don't know unless you read his resume that he's a leap year guy. So that's why he's so young. Uh, uh, and um, for all of us in the room who worked for him, I mean, he was the boss that we loved and, and uh, cared about deeply. Uh, thought it was interesting that recently, a couple years ago, the control center was um, uh, put his name on, uh, the center agreed to put his name on the control center. So we got a great big uh, Christopher Columbus craft uh, riding over the Mission Control Center. And as a matter of fact, even if we didn't have a big sign there, Chris would always be uh, paying attention to the Control Center and what went on in that uh, building. Uh, he's had all the awards in the world that NASA have, but Leadership Medal uh, and the uh, four Distinguished Service Medals, uh, Space Trophy, and uh, numerous other awards. Tom Stafford is our third member of the group. Uh, Tom uh, was here in the heyday, uh, and uh, it was a wonderful time for all of us. And uh, Tom was representative, as was Frank, of the astronaut office and the contributions that they made. Uh, Tom worked on Gemini uh, 6. He worked on Gemini uh, 9. Uh, he worked on Apollo 10, and he went on to do Apollo Soyuz later. Um, he had a fabulous record uh, in the flying area, and then he went on, he went back into the Air Force, and he went on and did some marvelous things while he was in the Air Force. He was involved in the beginnings of the stealth as a technology for airplanes. Uh, he tells me that he wrote the spec for uh, uh, the B-2 on a napkin one night when he was thinking clearly. and uh, and. Uh, and it turned out that the vehicle pretty much matched the requirements that he drew. Uh, Tom lives in, uh, well, he was, he's from Oklahoma. He lives there sometimes, and now he, he's living more permanently in Florida. Uh, wife there and uh, two, uh, two kids now, and two, kid, two earlier kids, two daughters earlier, and two boys now that he adopted from the Soviet Union, R Russian kids, and uh, took him in and uh, gave him a life. So with that, uh, I'm going to go uh, a little bit into the subject of why, why is this rendezvous important. For those of you who, who aren't involved in rendezvous, you would be asking that. Why is this a big deal? Um, and uh, it is a big deal. And for the people who practice it today, they've done it so many times that it's not considered difficult. But in our time when we were just inventing this, it was a big mystery and we were not sure of uh, what it was going to be like. And it was controversial when it came to its role in the lunar program. Uh, early policy decisions came quickly, I mean really quickly, after the Gagarin flight. That is the first flight that the Soviet Union put up an astronaut, a cosmonaut, uh, in um, April of 1961. Uh, and uh, soon thereafter, words, uh, President Kennedy had arrived at a conclusion that we would go land on the moon. There were several options considered. Uh, one was uh, just fly by the moon, one was fly in orbit around the moon, and one was to land on the moon. And when the various um, likelihoods of success uh, in terms of uh, our performance were evaluated, the landing on the moon was the thing that looked the most attractive to the policymakers, and that's what we ended up with in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, within a month of, or almost a month of, uh, yeah, within the month of uh, Gagarin's flight, we had an announcement from the president that we were going to land on the moon within the decade. And it was the within the decade that really uh, affected some of the decision making. We first started working on going to the moon with the biggest rocket you can possibly imagine. I think it was 
10 million pounds. At least one version was 10 million pounds. Some versions were bigger than that. And f by comparison, the, the, uh, the Saturn V that we used was uh, 6 million pounds on the, on the pad. So this was going to be a factor of two or better uh, beyond what we had done, what we had, the way we had really done it. And, uh, uh, and, and the options were to look at one of these great big rockets uh, and uh, either put it all up at once or put it up in two missions to an Earth orbit rendezvous uh, and then proceed from there. Uh, even splitting the elements up, it still was very, very costly. Uh, and a new, um, uh, John Hubelt uh, brought forward a new idea called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. And basically, his idea was rather than take everything down to the moon and back up and spend the propellant and the fuel to do that, uh, why don't we just park the stuff we need to come home in lunar orbit, uh, and then when the time comes, we send this little transport ship, the lunar module, down to the surface, back up, and then it returns to the larger equipment that would be the come home equipment, like the command module and the service module. Uh, that was his idea. It was a radical idea at the time, but he had the courage to sell it. It was kind of a David and Goliath story, I guess, in a way. As one fellow had this idea about how it should be done. And in the end, um, the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous allowed us to do the shuttle program, or the, the Apollo program, in the time that the President had specified for us. And um, and it turned out to be the best way to do the mission. And uh, we've become experts at rendezvous now in Earth orbit. And as I said, it's commonplace. But in those days, it was a very big deal. Uh, and um, making, uh, making it the way it was uh, probably kept the lunar program in schedule. And who knows? I don't know that. I don't know what our luck would have been building a rocket twice as big as a Saturn V. So. Uh, that would have been a real chore. Uh, so it, the, the Lunar Ronde Orbit Rendezvous had a lot to do with the success of the Apollo mission and the continuation of the Apollo program when otherwise it might have uh, staggered under the weight of the size of equipment we were trying to launch. Um, some of the people have been mentioned, John Mayer, and, uh, who was the chief of mission planning, uh, Bill Tyndall, uh, and Ken mentioned some of the other people. but. Rendezvous is a big deal. It was a big deal at the time. It made Apollo the success that it was. It enabled Apollo to be the success that it was. And a lot of great people participated in putting it together. With that, uh, I'm going to start by asking Chris to talk about what was going on in the Gemini program leading up to uh, uh, 76, and then how did we get into that? Uh, we had a failure, and how did we get into the 76? Chris? guys up here uh, we were all thank you uh, we were all in not in, in uh, this time period 1965 we're probably in the best period of our life uh, now Frank Borman didn't like me worth a damn back then because every time he got I got near him he had something changed in what he was about to do uh, and, uh, and that was particularly true on uh, Gemini 76. Uh, Mr. Um, Burke, Walter Burke was the vice president of uh, uh, McDonnell Douglas and John Yardley was the program manager at that time. And uh, this guy here was sitting on the pad. And uh, First thing you know, we got counted down and everything was just lovely. Everything went fine. And uh, we were waiting for the Atlas of Gina to be launched. It launched, it did a good, the Atlas did a great job. And then it got into orbit and within maybe five, six seconds after insertion, the engine blew up. And uh, the RSO at the Cape was in my ear saying, I'm, tra I'm tracking multiple pieces. 
and uh, I see five of them. So then I had to tell this guy that, well, you're not going today. <laughs> so we took him back off the pad. So he didn't like me that day very much either. Now, as a result of that, Yardley and Burke were always coming up with great ideas and uh, they went to see George Miller and uh, said, look, we, we've got a, a, a hole in our schedule here. We don't have a target vehicle. Why don't we uh, launch Gemini uh, 6 and then have Gemini, Gemini 7 go up later and rendezvous with it? And that will fulfill a lot of things we want to do in Gemini. And, I'm, and we believe you can do it. And uh, George Miller didn't like that very much. He never did like anything that didn't come out of his own head. Uh, at any rate, they decided they'd come to Houston and talk to George Lowe and uh, Bob Gilruth, which they did. And they started talking about what they wanted to do, and they immediately called me into the, into the office and said, which was not unusual, by the way, and uh, said, uh, they've got this idea. What do you think about it? They want to put these two vehicles up there and rendezvous with them. We won't have a capability of dock, but we could do all the other parts of rendezvous. And uh, we, we, we'd like to know what you think about it. Uh, it's kind of surprising to me because here we are with uh, the need of either two launch pads or something like that, and we didn't have it. We'd have, furthermore, we didn't have any money to build another pad, so it was kind of useless to try to even think about that. But I said, well, I'll go talk to the people at the Cape and I'll talk to my guys and we'll see what we can, might be able to do. And they said, well, uh, if you're going to launch the vehicle, you're not going to be able to launch one and then repair, repair the pad and then put the next one back up in time for the Gemini 7 to still have any consumables left. And uh, we said, wait, wait a minute. We, we've, got a, we've got a game plan that we've had for quite some time, and that is that if we have a hurricane at the Cape, uh, we can uh, take, the, take the vehicle down, put it back in the hangar, wait for the hurricane to pass, go back and start from where we started again. That was an idea that we were going to, it was a real tough idea for the Cape to do was to start the countdown over again. They didn't like doing things like that. They, they didn't like the ideas that like that at all. But at any rate, it was a possibility. So we started looking at that and lo and behold, we figured out that we could indeed put the Gemini 7 on the pad, launch it, and then clean up the pad in probably two days, having had the Gemini 6 on the pad and counted it down to the point where we were only two days away from launch. That's a damn good idea. We'll give it a try. And of course the guys in, in the MPAD are always anxious to do new ideas. And so, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll go do that. So we convinced, uh, finally convinced George Miller that that was a good idea. And he talked to um, Webb about it, and Webb thought it was a hell of an idea. And he said, I'll go talk to the president about it. And indeed he did. And in four days, from the time that uh, John Yardley and Walter Burke had been in Houston and talked to us about doing this idea of putting two vehicles up there, four days we had the president of the United States saying that we're going to launch two vehicles and rendezvous. Think you could do that today? <laughs> I, did, I didn't believe it myself at the time. At any rate, off we were. Now, you want me to go on from there, Glenn? Uh, you want to go further oh, you're taking, there? That's, you're taking us to uh, Frank's lift up. Okay. So, Frank, you might tell us. Might. Tell us. Uh, what did you make of this when it first got started and the decisions and well, what happened you know, during the flow? From Gemini 7 standpoint, all this work that was being done on the Cape and the, the rendezvous really didn't mean much to us, to be honest with you, for, because we were simply the target. I was more interested in figuring out how we could 
pack all the consumable, I mean, pack all of the excrement and get it home without having it all in place. So uh, we, we, we were simply the dumb target, as I told Glenn earlier. Uh, however, uh, as the mission became more and more positive, uh, it, it tended to grow. I remember for a while there, they said, what we'll do is we'll, we'll rendezvous close and then we'll put Tom and Jim, we'll trade places. We'll trade. That, fortunately, we had people like Dr. Kraft here and that didn't get far. <laughs> you didn't get very far, but it, I didn't like it, that. you remember that? I do indeed. <laughs> and, you know, we, we've no, been... I couldn't get the damn door closed. <laughs> half the space and now they're going to switch. The I'm both of them out in space and nobody could help them at all. And, well, and he was almost six, you were over six feet anyway, it never fit. So, so basically, uh, uh, we, we did a little bit of... Uh, Station keeping ourselves with the with the second stage of the Titan, and it worked out well. I think it was because we were close enough; we didn't get far enough away, so we we didn't have to to uh, use the rendezvous techniques. One of the things that's interesting that still haunts me a bit uh, during the process of station keeping with the second stage of the Titan, I refer to it as a bogey. You know, we got the bogey. It was some mag true magazine. It was uh, wrote an article about how we'd seen a UFO. And, and believe it or not, to this day I still get an occasional letter that says the government has threatened to kill my family if I tell them anybody that I that I saw you. It was that kind of nonsense. But uh, all in all, as I said, we were basically the uh, the benign target in the hopes that uh, that Tom and, and Wally would uh, would come up and join us. Well, for, for benign target, but he was uh, in space in a vehicle that was about the size of a Volkswagen with two people in a spacesuit, and the, and the guy in Washington <laughs> would not let him get out of the, of a spacesuit. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if you can imagine somebody being in that spacesuit in, in that kind of underwear and having to itch. <laughs> See, to me, that'd be a hell of a thing. And, uh, and we, we used to talk about it each night. We had a, what we call a UF six, and uh, press didn't know what we were talking about. They did eventually. They caught on to what we were doing, and he was trying to get me to let them get out of the suit, and I was trying to get George Miller to do it. And uh, that was that was. I'll tell that story a little later. <laughs> Uh, Frank, the other thing people would be interested in this Volkswagen. This uh, Volkswagen you're in. Uh, what was it like trying to live inside a little cabin with a guy sitting next to you and everything else that you had to do to live? Well, you know, it's interesting because Chris mentioned how fast NASA operated in that period. And when we, uh, when Jim Lovell and I looked at the results of Gemini 5, which was an eight-day mission, they all complained about the spacesuits. And so we went to uh, our bosses and said, hey, let's just get a, like an inner tube that we can, a lightweight spacesuit that we can use uh, in the event of a problem and not worry about the, having to stay in that big one, the heavy set one. Uh, and so in a very short period of time, it was developed. And we, we flew basically in our, uh, in our underwear when, when Miller finally was prevailed upon by Chris to, to use common sense, which was rare with him. But uh, but uh, the, the way that NASA reacted at that period to me is still unbelievable. I just I just don't understand it. And the decisions were made with people that knew them at the lowest possible level, and it was a uh, it was a remarkable experience. Living in there for two weeks was a was a, frankly a pain in the ass, if you want to know the truth. And when I think of people living in that. Space station for a year, I feel for them. They're really dedicated, a hell of a lot more dedicated than I would be. I mean, you couldn't keep me up there for a year if you paid me double. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the spacecraft itself began to go away. The systems began to break down after about 12 days. The fuel cells uh, were losing pressure. The, the thrusters were beginning to, to uh, malfunction. If you wanted to yeah, a roll to the right, you had to hit a yaw tar. We, we had it all figured out, but it was, uh, it was concerning to me because I was afraid we might have to land early, and there was a typhoon out in the Pacific, 
and uh, I was frankly ready to come down. But I didn't want, I didn't want to, uh, after, this was after the rendezvous. I didn't want to stay up there and, and have to land in a typhoon, but uh, I think it's a, a testimony to the confidence that I had in the people on the ground that uh, Dr. Kraft Chris came on and said, uh, gave me a report on the fuel cells and so on and so forth. And after that, I had no, I had absolute confidence in the people that supported us, absolute confidence. Uh, and I, I, want, I never have had an opportunity to thank you guys enough for the dedication and the knowledge and the, and the skill that you brought to the table. And I thank you right now because the people on the ground were our ace in the hole. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, the team of people we had in, the, in this country at that point in time was uh, really pretty miraculous. They could, they could do most anything and the challenge they could and they could come up with the convincing arguments of why we could and why we couldn't do what we had to do. And my, we had two, we had two fuel cells in the, in the vacuum chamber at uh, uh, McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis doing the same thing we thought probably was what the spacecraft was doing. So they were convincing me and I was convincing Frank that the fuel cells were going to last. And uh, I think they, we had, the whole team did a hell of a job. That's right. Tom, you want to talk about uh, the, tech, the uh, Titan scrub and getting ready to launch? Well, let me go back a little before that. Um, I was on the backup crew of the first Gemini flight and with uh, Gus and John. They launched March 23rd and 65, and Wally and I were then to do six, and we knew that before, uh, and do the first rendezvous in space on an Agena vehicle. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, there wasn't anything in the simulations that we had that we could work with. And um, so the... Uh, we were started out and finally Gemini 3 went good for three orbits and then Gemini 4 uh, uh, went out and uh, so um, they were going to try a very ambitious in the meanwhile the way our system here reacted to the Soviet system and the way the Soviet system reacted to us people can never underestimate that because they drove us and we drove them the more you dig into it and we were sitting around in crew quarters about two days before the first launch of Gemini 3 and the brakes and the, the prime and backup cruiser breaks in the news and shows a picture suddenly of Alexei Leonov doing the first spacewalk. It shows him pushing off, he floats around, and he said, see, no problem. It looks simple. Well, we didn't know he nearly got killed trying to get back in. I found that out later as I was working on a on Apollo Soyuz, and I could speak a little Russian, he could speak English, but we, you know, we were kind of fat, dumb, and happy, so anyway, originally one of the plans that uh, was there that I was to do the first simple space run, uh, spacewalk, which was not really a walk, it was a stand-up on Gemini 6. Just open the hatch, have a double link hose, and maneuver around and get back down. And uh, so, but we had to respond, so real fast, Gemini 4. We had to do a spacewalk, and so they hurried up and had a, a blowdown chest pack, Ed White. All he had was his regular gloves, didn't have EVA gloves or anything like that. So he went out for, Alexei was out for 12 minutes, and so then White went out for 22 minutes. And then he got tried to get back in, and the suit balloons, and you know, when a suit balloons, it balloons this way, but the critical length is height. And you, you had to do, we call it the alley-oop maneuver to get back into Gemini. There's a little bar folded out underneath the pilot's seat, and you'd kind of get your legs underneath you and bend like this, and then reach up like and click the hatch home. Well, Ed's suit, he couldn't make it. And Ed was a strong person. I guess all the adrenaline was pushing, and he finally got it closed, but his heart rate went over 220 beats a minute. And... Uh, so I said, hey, we've got to think about how we walk and work in space a little bit. And uh, we didn't take it far enough, it turns out. But uh, anyway, that was the background. But also, 
they had two flashing lights on the second stage they put on the Titan II and uh, they didn't have the same luck that Frank had. They, um, they went in the darkness and they got behind it. We call it the McDivitt Quadrant. And so when it came out in daylight, he was further behind it and above it. So it's an intuition just flying airplanes. You'd head towards it. So he started adding energy to his orbit. And he kept doing this. And he kept thrusting more. So that's called the McDivitt Quadrant there, when you're high and behind. So we set out with our group and flight crew operations, Paul Kramer, Dean Grimm, and then from mission planning analysis, we had uh, Bill Tyndall, Ed Lineberry, and went over a whole series of orbital mechanics. We still hadn't decided which way would we do the, the, the rendezvous. And uh, there were three different approaches. One's a pure home and transfer, which is the simplest way to do it, you know, get the most efficiency. But the problem was at the end, there's wide dispersions. Then there's another approach to it. And, uh, but that would end up doing the rendezvous at dark and also the ground stations. We didn't have synchronous satellites and we only had a few ground stations around. That didn't appear too good. And Lineberry called me about this time. This was in, oh, about, this was just before Ed White flew with, with uh, Jim McDivitt and June said, he had this document, it was a Russian document. Do you remember that, Chris? Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he had asked Wally and I to come over and look at it. And so, anyway, Tyndall, Lineberry, myself, Paul Kramer, Dean Grimm, some other people. And I, I couldn't read a word of Russian, but what it said was uh, the uh, theory of uh, a rendezvous using concentric planes and co-elliptic approach. And that was the basic title. And but. The, I could understand the diagrams. And the main thing, it looked like in the end, you could really tolerate more dispersions and, and it could really be the way to go. So that was how we ended up doing it. We used a Russian you know, system. We used a Russian design for the co-elliptic uh, phase of rendezvous. And then, but the problem was, we didn't have any uh, systems here at JS, uh, but then probably it's a manned spacecraft center. Uh, at that time, uh, that could could do a rendezvous. We, we could get in close, and we were trying to get software worked out for the Gemini, you know, software. We had 4,096 words, Frank, I think. I think there were 36-bit words, but uh, that was a, it wasn't too many. And um, so uh, the only one, that, uh, McDonald, it was McDonald Aircraft then, uh, they had a hybrid mainframe. It's part analog, part digital, down in the basement. They had a plywood mock-up, but they had the control, control panel, the computer, and the readout, uh, which it wasn't a readout screen. It'd go blink, 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 just like a slot machine. That was how the digits came up. <laughs> it wasn't too fast. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, We'd, so anyway, the prime and backup crew were up there working with people from Bill Tyndall's office, from our office, from flight crew operations support, and uh, we'd get started. And, but every afternoon at 3.30, we'd have to stop, because Mr. McDonald, for those that knew him, was a very thrifty character, Scotsman, and he rented out his computers to his brother, who was chairman of Boltman's Bank in St. Louis, so that would stop. And, during the night, that would process data for Boatman's Bank, and we weren't, and we weren't getting anywhere. You know, we we're trying to look at dispersions and try to work out charts and see. We had a, a radar, a computer, and a platform, and if they all worked all right, theoretically, with what the ground could do, tracking our, our networks around, feeding it into mission control, and the vectors coming up, we could do it. But what happens if the computer fails? What happens if the radar fails? And what happens if the platform fails? Damn what ifs. <laughs> yeah. So it, uh, we were trying to work all this out. And so anyway, we had a great relationship with Mr. McDonald. For those that knew him, he was a great American, wonderful individual. Great guy. And he said, uh, for, for, and the astronauts were his boys. And he said, anytime you have a problem, you just call me. So Wally and I got on the phone to him and said, we need to talk to you, Mr. Mack. We, we need this computer complex 
more than the time we have because we'd start 9 or 10 in the morning when we'd finally get it up and running and we'd knock off at 3.30 in the meanwhile it might break down once or twice and we were trying to work out charts to, to work these failures for radar for a platform for the, uh, the computer and uh, so he said let's come over at my house for dinner tonight so Wally and I went over to Mr. Mack's house for had dinner with him and Miss Mack and drinks and Mr. Mack would always carry a little black book around and he stuttered a little bit and so he said we, said, we said, we can't guarantee we can pull off this rendezvous, which is the basis of how we're going to go to the moon, unless we get this it's worked out. So he noted that down. The next morning, Dave Lewis, who was president of McDonnell Aircraft and later became chairman of General Dynamics, came in to see Wally and I in our little office said, look, just want to let you know that Mr. Mack said you have a com that computer complex 24 hours a day if you need it from now on. So starting in about July, when we were going to launch in October on the Agena, we started working. And we worked till 3 o'clock in the morning. We'd have prime crew would work it for five or six hours. Backup crew would work it. And we're working primarily the, the final phase, the co-elliptic phase, uh, with, the, with the radar out with the, and dispersions of trajectories. And it was a bear. Buzz Alder was up there. He gave us some good help. And, uh, but we had a team of about 10 people, and we worked till about 3 in the morning, and then start again the next morning. But after about six weeks, we had it all worked out. We had a, I had a book about this thick of charts and nomographs, so I could take a, a loss of a computer, loss of a, a radar, and also the platform, which was the most difficult by far. I felt very comfortable. I could lose a computer and we could do the co-elliptic rendezvous with the data that the ground would shoot us and also my onboard charts. And uh, if I lost the radar, it would be more difficult. But if I lost the platform, that would really be a bear because you'd try to be sure that if I was giving that, uh, Wally the, the data that he could get, uh, be sure we didn't get anything out of plane because that out of plane component of the two orbits could just eat your lunch real fast. And uh, so we finally, after six weeks, had it done and felt very confident. So here we were all set on uh, August, uh, I mean, October 25th, uh, there in um, it's 1965. And the Air Force made a mistake on the Agena. In rocket propulsion, you always lead fuel first, followed by oxidizer a few milliseconds later. Von Braun found that out in Germany back in the 1944-45 when he used to blow up V2s all the time. And for some reason, the Air Force made a change in the Agena and had an oxidizer-rich lead-in, followed by fuel and boom. There it went. All these pieces. Pretty stupid, wasn't it? It was stupid the Air Force. <laughs> and so... Uh, we, we had a scrub out and got got wet out that night. That's all I'll say. And uh, anyway, we were all set. So and that's when uh, what Chris went through uh, the uh, the logic that went through is started with Burke and Yardley and then Orr and then Frank and uh, other people. So then we got all set to go though, and uh, we finally we were down there to watch Frank and. Jim Lovell lift off, and I really wasn't sweating Frank out or Jim. What I was sweating out were those fuel cells because of the experience that Pete Conrad had and uh, along with uh, Gordo Cooper on Jiminy. Well, lucky as hell, you didn't have the fuel cells. I know. Yeah, no, <laughs> we, we had batteries. We had batteries on six, but Jiminy 5 had the first fuel cells, and, uh, and they went eight days, and they were degrading, too, all the time. In fact, on every Jiminy mission, the fuel cells tended to degrade, but it got better as the program went on. So I was sweating out the, the fuel cells and probably the thrusters too. And uh, anyway, they got in orbit, everything was going great, and we were to launch nine days later. Um, so we were all strapped in, squared away, and you counted in T minus three seconds, and you could hear the Titan engines, LR 87 started to. Shake, rattle, and roll, and build up T minus two, three, 
and then exactly at T zero, the engine shut down. We had the what was equivalent to the liftoff light. We had the clock start, the computer start, and it's, we're told if that happens, you have lifted off. And we also knew we had a dead man's curve in that Titan II of about probably three quarters of a second. From the time you'd see something happen, you could pull the D-ring and react, and the pyros would fire, the hatches were open and get out. And also, we knew nothing about pure oxygen and saturated. We had about 16 psi of pure O2. So, anyway, we're sitting there, and it's Wally's responsibility, my responsibility to back him up, and it went down to zero. There's also one other clue, and that's a fellow astronaut looking at a TV monitor. And that was Alan Bean. And he was the only one to call liftoff when he saw first motion of the booster above the pad. And Bean followed the procedures exactly. He didn't say a thing. But Wally and I knew in the seat of our pants from the, the simulations we had, including that dynamic simulator over here, we hadn't lifted off. And we were just stuck there. Yeah, you, 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 brought, you bring up all kinds of things to me. Number one, I want to tell you that the, the uh, Russians were always ahead of us, right? We designed the first EVA in a staff meeting. That's how long it took us to do it. <laughs> and that's the truth. The gurus asked Jay, do you think you could do an uh, uh, EVA on Germany 4? And Mac took that and said he was crazy, and he said yes. <laughs> and we did. You don't think that was doing something. <laughs> but secondly, I want to, you said you're talking about the Russians and their rendezvous. The first time we saw rendezvous in the newspaper was when they did a flyby at thousands of miles an hour. That was their first rendezvous. Right? They didn't do rendezvous, they just looked at each other as they went by, and if you look, didn't look fast enough, they, they wouldn't even see them. Yeah, they weren't but with that was their, that was how they beat us to rendezvous <laughs> in, the, in the first, in the first uh, go-round, right? Yep. They had two... Sp I don't want you Russia. to praise those Russians too much. No, no. <laughs> but, but, but they... But, but they, they, they were always in my back pocket. I didn't like those guys. <laughs> But, but the press would always play it up, Chris. That was, huh? the, the press would always play them up, too. Yeah, that's right. C Chris, they, they, they got everything ahead of us. And they, and, but when we flew that flight, your flight, 76, we never heard from them again. <laughs> well, you, you can't discount the Russians, though. They, they provided the, the competition exactly. that we needed. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was extremely important, I think. Think of the Russians were talking about going to Mars. Now we'd have a lot more interest in going to Mars. <laughs> right on. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of new things about this, Tom. About you doing all the rendezvous and everything. I thought Aldrin gave you a package. It was all done. <laughs> <laughs> right after he got through dancing with the stars. <laughs> and that's not true. <laughs> I, well, I, I don't think you can also discount the importance of not ejecting yeah. at that point. If that would have happened, first of all, I don't think you'd be here because I didn't trust those ejection seats oh, on the uh, oh, The second thing is that would have destroyed that mission and it, it would have delayed the rendezvous. Yeah. It might have really, in the final analysis, impacted the, uh, the Apollo 11 landing. I don't think there's any question about it. Now, that was a, a remarkable decision. I'm surprised that Miller didn't want to prosecute Wally for, not, for violating mission rules. Right on. Uh, because the mission rule was he should have gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the mission rule said you should have gone. <laughs> right. And I, I said in the same breath, hey, they should have launched. And I said, thank God they didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, also, we're, I forgot we're on hot mic and, you know, a shutdown. And then the, uh, they said, you got we have a fire break down broke out down below it was hypergolic fuel and uh, anyway so they'll put it out and then I think I was quoted saying ah oh, shucks <laughs> <laughs> well another thing that you all haven't mentioned I think for a while somebody came up with the idea of putting a a target adapter on Gemini or a docking adapter on Gemini 7 so that you guys could dock with it 
Right. And I didn't want any part of that. So. No. I mean, after all, Wally was in the Navy, and I was not a little concerned about his flying ability. <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, uh, this uh, Titan shut down. So the question is, well, all by itself, so why did it shut down? And uh, that ensued an uh, investigation. Chris, you talked about the dust caps, but go ahead. How did we figure out well, what we need to know uh, about that? When I started looking at the telemetry of the uh, those first stage engines, uh, we also, NASA, had done a good job. You know, the the Titans that we flew for Titan Gemini was assembled at Martin, Baltimore, where the main Titan II weapon system line for the weapon <coughs> systems were done at Denver. So they wanted it completely separate and given special uh, attention, but also we put some uh, modifications into it called emergency detection system. There had to be a series of things happen before, you know, the next step would go on. We also put accumulators in there to prevent pogo and various things. And finally, the Air Force <coughs> did adapt some of our things, but that EDS saved us because the well, thrust... The first time we flew the Titan, we broke all the glass inside the Gemini yeah. in the cockpit, if you recall, from the pogo that we experienced. Yeah. The Air Force said, we don't have any pogo. <laughs> the, uh, so the, as they looked at it, you'd see the thrust chamber built up like this, and then suddenly one of the thrust chambers started down, and then the shutdown signal came. So what happened to that one thrust chamber? And they started getting into it and pulling it apart, and uh, somebody really violated a procedure. We had these plastic dust caps over the gas generator where you have a pyro that spins up a turbine and that starts the pumps going in a autogenous speed system that goes into it. And somebody, some dumb character, instead of removing the cap had taken the fuel line that went in to, to feed the gas generator and screwed the plug in on top of it, the, the fuel line. So the pyro was fired. That was enough impulse to start the main engine with those turbo pumps. But then there was no fuel in there. And uh, the oxidizer was there, but no fuel. And so it just spun down, and it went down like that. If that had occurred a few seconds later, it would have been a bad scene, I'll tell you. Yeah, and then, and then we had to reconcile what caused that problem and uh, how, how we could launch. I want you to know that was the, the second six. time that happened to me, not the first. The first time I looked out, to, I had two, two, two experiences on, on, on Mercury uh, 1, we launched the escape tower, right? And on Gemini 6, I saw this big explosion and all that beautiful pink glad, uh, gas and so forth and bam! It, spacecraft is still there. So that was the second time that had happened to me. <laughs> well, we finally, uh, they finally got the erector up and we got down and <clears throat> I'm amazed they found the problem and got the, the, the vehicle turned around in a couple of days because Frank only had so much expendables up there. And so that was on the 9th of uh, December, 65. And then we launched then on the 12th of, the, of uh, December. You got oh, to give credit to Martin for that. They did a hell of a job yeah. there on yeah. cleaning, up, cleaning up the pad at the same time of then replacing that turbo pump yeah. was really something. They did that in three days. Unheard of. So, and then you know, by the Jedi time you have your, your third countdown, <laughs> You know, you, you get used to it, so. Did, were, so you, were you confident that everything was, was going to be okay inside of that rocket after they fixed it the second time? Well, you know, after having the, the Gina blow up and then having this thing happen to it, Chris, they well, here we go again. <laughs> and this, well, this time you, it worked perfectly. I didn't have a hell of a lot of confidence in that, but it worked. But uh, that, was, that was a touch and go situation. Well, Frank, you had to listen to all this a long way away. What were you making out of all this as we went along? Well, we were anxious for Gemini 6 to get off, and of course we're disappointed with the first problem 
But again, it, I mean, I'm just being very honest with you guys. Uh, our main major, major concern was lasting for two weeks. And uh, I'm very glad that you made it, Tom. <laughs> and, and it was nice to see you. But thank you about that time. I didn't give a damn. I just, I just wanted to stay two weeks. We were, as I said, we were basically the target. Uh, and uh, although we did get the station keep a little bit once you guys got up to us, it was a remarkable job. Because we're standing there, sitting there in, the, in this Gemini 7, looking out, all of a sudden there it looks like a, a very bright star, uh, a light. And then it kept getting closer and closer and closer reflection. All of a sudden they came right up and a beautiful well, formation that rendezvous and the enemy is station keeping and uh, it was uh, it was something where you made the extremely difficult seem easy and that was the, one of the functions of NASA in that period they made the impossible seem easy not right yep. you guys well, did a great job thank you one thing we did with all, all that time we worked at McDonnell Douglas we wanted to make it where it would be pilot initiative it would be it would be common sense you it, it was something you could do and and do it repeatedly and and it would be natural so we got into a you know, we did a series of catch up to keep raising the apogee we started 700 miles behind Gemini 7 on liftoff and then an apogee would give it a kick a series of kicks and then finally we get a plane change you always do the plane change at apogee since it takes a little bit less a lot fuel and then um, we got through this about 170 miles back. It's called normal slow rate. That's when you go co-elliptic. We were match their ellipticity. We were 15 miles below. And I'd worked it out with Frank that they'd, you know, Gemini 7 would be going backwards. And they had the transponder. If you see a picture a head on a Gemini 7, you'll see a little gold circle down at near the bottom of the nose of the spacecraft. That was the transponder for our radar. And then uh, I told Frank that as we as we kept going like this, we'd look at him, we'd, even though for him to pitch down. So I wanted maximum return for the radar. And we locked on at 270 miles, which was great. And uh, finally, I'd call 10 degree increments as we got closer in, uh, it would pitch up. He would just pitch up. He, Frank would pitch down when I'd call in 10 degree increments. And then we got at 27 degrees, that was when we would thrust directly towards Gemini 7. And we used about 28 feet per second, but that was it's called terminal phase initiate. That was a critical part. And that's when I had my charts and working at it. And we had the IBM computer and it was slow cranking up and Chris's people called up and by the time, not to be a little bolster anything, by the time uh, that, uh, the uh, Chris called up and uh, the computer had there, I already had the, at least my nomograph because we had a somewhat nominal thing. I had the solution I th and I agreed with what you did. Yeah. And then Wally, then the computer cranked up and so Wally said, what should I do? I said, go ahead and it's all within one feet per second. So I said, just take this, the on board. So that's what we no, so I'll tell you, I, I think the thing about rendezvous is that it's contrary to doing what you normally think. And, and when we first tried it uh, on uh, Gemini 4, and uh, they tried to catch the, the, the uh, second stage after they got up there, and all they did was go away from it and get further and further away from it and waste more and more fuel. And, uh, it, and uh, now to show you how fast they learned, up comes Frank Borman and he does the same thing with the second stage of the Titan and lo and behold he can do it because he's done it and he's practiced it in the simulator and that's how important the learning process to me. It was always absolutely amazing to me that the next crew already knew what the f first crew had already done. It was absolutely the, the transfer of, of information from the, between the crews was fantastic. There was another key thing, you know, as you came up, it was 27 degrees pitch, and we gave it the impulse. The trajectory of this is Gemini 7, 
we'd come up with a key thing was this final approach was called inertial pro approach. We'd do it just before sunrise so you'd have the stars in the background and here would be Gemini 7. And for those of you that fly an airplane, have an instrument landing system, it's just like flying an ILS. If Gemini 7 moved to the right, you'd thrust to the right. If it moved up, you'd thrust to the left. So it was just a piece of cake to fly it in. It was just like flying an ILS. And that's the way this trajectory, because if we hadn't have done anything, the trajectory would have taken us like that, up around and back down. Well, another, another amazing thing that I found in the, in the brief time that we did station keeping was how accurate the flight control, wonderful flight control system was on Gemini. It was, you could actually fly the thing to within eight inches of Gemini 6 and, and it was stable and it was very, very well, well designed. You know, the 6 and 7 mission, there, there were four fundamental things you had to prove to go to the moon on. <clears throat> One, we had to prove uh, long duration. You had to have a guided re-entry, you had to have EVA, and you had to have rendezvous. And on 6 and 7, we accomplished three of those four, and the uh, Gemini 4 had already done the EVA. So basically, the Gemini program was an essential part of going to the moon, in my opinion. Absolutely. I, I, I think the whole program depended on the results of Gemini. It was, yeah, it was a great and, foundation. And just, just think, we, we, in that year, in, the, in 1965, we did an EVA, we did rendezvous, we, docked, we did docking with the uh, Atlas and Geno. That was, a, that was a pretty good accomplishment. Try doing that in NASA these days. <laughs> well, you know, n another thing about NASA back then, if I can just inject myself for a moment into the Apollo program that shows you how quickly they respond. First time I went out to Downey to the engineering mock-up of the Apollo, I pulled back on the controller and the nose went down. I pushed forward and the nose went up. And I called the engineer over and I said, hey, you got the polarity screwed up on this, fix it, would you? And he said, oh no, this is the way we're going to fly it. And I said, what do you mean it's the way you're going to fly it? He said, well, we found out through our human factors people that it's far easier to fly the target than the spacecraft. In other words, so when, you, when you pull back, the target went up, but, but well, your nose went down. So I said, well, that may well be the way that you're going to fly it on a simulator, but that's not the way that we've flown 1,000 hours on an airplane. You better fix it. He said, oh, no, this is it. So I got back and called, I think I called Deke, and within three hours we had that change. <laughs> but it, it, it was a remarkable organization, and it was because of people like Chris and, and Glenn and all of you guys with the gray and bald. How would you get so old? <laughs> Unbelievable, but I, I, I still marvel at NASA in the 60s. Yeah, absolutely. On the, uh, you know, one the, thing to follow up what the, Frank said on the uh, flyability of the Gemini spacecraft, McDonnell Aircraft did a great job on building the right torque to inertia ratio and impulse to inertia. After we came up to and did the rendezvous, and then we got alongside, and we closed in within, oh, a foot, 18 inches, 30 centimeters, and it was just stable. And then for one time, and we stayed uh, station keeping around, and they station keeps on us, and uh, we stayed there for about four and a half hours. And one thing we, we did, just to see how it would work out, we damped all the rates the best we could, damped the position, and just hands off. And for 20 minutes, we just stayed right there with Gemini 7. So it was, it was really a, a great um, you know, demonstration and knowledge learning of what we could do. And also, it was so fine control, we figured after what we had, the docking should be a piece of cake. Yeah. It'd be very easy. Yeah. And it turned out it was. One thing you haven't mentioned, Tom, was that uh, it guided reentry. I would like to point out to all of you in the audience that Gemini 7 came closer to the target than Gemini 6 when we had done <laughs> but, but the closest of any of the Geminis was Gemini 9. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were 700 yards. <laughs> you can't be the first liar up here, guys. <laughs> Uh, Frank is. Uh, I think every, Frank? every pilot that flew commented on how stable the vehicle was in space. They never, never seen anything like that. You know, fighter pilots are used to touching the stick and the thing goes crazy. 
That didn't happen in space flight. Very steady, very positive. Going control was outstanding. Frank talked about the reaction of NASA at the time, and uh, as if as if he was an observer, but he was a participant in the sense that after the fire, when George Lowe became the program manager, he tasked Frank to go out to Downey, and I don't know what he told him, but I, near as I could tell, it seemed to be, do whatever you have to do to get uh, Downey on track, and uh, if anything is being held up on the government side, you have my authority to fix it. So Frank went out there, and uh, he knew that he had the authority to do whatever had to be done, and he did. And yeah, uh, Frank, you were key contributor. Well, Glenn, you know, look at the people we had. We had Chris, the, the, the people that really made it work. Chris, George Lowe, Dr. Gilruth, Sam Phillips, I think, was extremely yeah. important. And, and you can't overlook the fact that Jim Webb was absolutely critical because he kept the money coming, he kept the Congress satisfied. The fact that, that NASA was allowed to investigate the fire itself, I think was a remarkable achievement of, of oh, Dr. Man. Webb's. So I'm, I'm certain that there are just as many dedicated people in NASA today in the, in the uh, Mission Control Center and so on and so forth. All I can tell you is that I thank God every night that I was there here in the 60s because we had everything going for us. We had the country behind us. We had the competent, dedicated people on the ground. And, and we had a, a good group of people in the air, or in the space, I should say. You know, uh, when I made the first presentation to Sam Phillips about Apollo 8, the first quiet statement he made back to me was, thank God we got some people around that are willing to make changes to what's being done in order to get the job done. Yeah. And that was Sam Phillips. He never he never got the credit he deserved. I don't think I, Dr. Gilruth ever so achieved either. the recognition he should have either, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I don't think so either. Yeah, I think uh, <coughs> Phillips is probably one of the best program managers this country has ever, ever seen. Had. Ever. But he was a very quiet individual. And everybody has heard a lot about Von Braun, but yet Gilruth and what he did here was every bit as much as Von yeah. Braun. And Sam Phillips was above that, but Phillips wanted no publicity. Most people in the Air Force still don't know who Sam Phillips is. I think, he, I think he helped to keep Miller under control, too. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Miller was just really something else, and I thank God we had Sam Phillips there. He, yeah. That's right. He was really great. Now, one thing is, following what Frank said, you know, thank God we were there at that time, and Glenn and Chris, but uh, it's, I've not, it's in the Air Force. I still keep touch with a lot of my Air Force friends. And it takes, and they have, are in the same mode, kind of like NASA. There's always a thousand people that can say no, but not many people that can say yes. And it's built up to layers of bureaucracy, where in, at NASA at the time, it would take, you know, just uh, five or six key people, and that would be the decision. And like when I was deputy chief of staff for R&D, I started all those stealth programs. We had only a handful of people knew about it. And we flew the F-117A, the first stealth attack plane, two years and eight months from the time the contract was signed. And then you see what it takes for the F-35, 14 years. But yeah, there has to be layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And so the Air Force is suffering the same thing in the DOD. Well, you, you look, I don't want to get into Apollo again, but when you look at the, you know, they changed our mission to lunar orbit. I sat down in a meeting with, with Chris and some of his people one afternoon, and I know, it must have been three or four hours, they outlined the mission for Apollo 8. Uh, and it was because we all respected this man right here. You know, would somebody come up with an idea, and then Chris would say, no, yes, sir. And we went away. I, I can't imagine how long it would take today to define a mission. You'd, we'd had no committees, no nothing at all. We had a boss that knew what he was talking about. It was remarkable. And good guys to go execute. <laughs> <laughs> well, Frank, how did you feel when your buddies there left you? 
Well, uh, I'll be honest with you, we'd been up there for a long time. I've been up there 12 days before you. Yeah, one thing I was a little envious of, I think that you and Wally were in the air t or in the space total of 19 hours. Yeah. You buggers. <laughs> <laughs> you left us and we still had 24 more, to, 48 more to go. Uh, and it was quite the high point of the mission, to be honest with you, because here we were participating, even though we were just a dumb target in a, in a very historic rendezvous. Uh, and, and then our fuel cells were giving us a problem. We were out of, out of reaction control fuel. So uh, the last two days of, of, a, of Gemini 7 until we got the, the bedtime story from Chris about uh, the fuel cells would make it were a long time. Uh, and, and it was the high point of the mission when they came to us. But I, I, I repeat, uh, I had nothing to do with Gemini 6. I had un, no, no understanding of the rendezvous situation. I'll, we were simply the target. We were glad to see them, and we envied them when they left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know the, I don't know. The, I, I suspect you know this, but uh, there's a there's a guy named uh, uh, from uh, New Little's Raiders. Phil, no, Davey Jones. Davey Jones. Jones. Davey yeah. Davey Jones. And uh, I I talked to uh, Frank one evening, and I said. I, I said I got to do something about this. So I went to the telephone and I called George Miller, and he said, uh, "I said I want I want to let them both out of the spacesuits." He said, "You can't do that." I said, "Why not?" He said, "That ruin, ruins the experiment." I said, uh, "Miller, Doctor Miller." I said, "There's one damn word you don't have in your dictionary, and that's compassion." You better start having some. And he said he mumbled and grumbled back at me, you know. He said, "I'll send Davy Jones down there tomorrow." And Davy Jones, I, it was a, one of the do real guys in the B twenty five. Got he, he had to bail out over Korea and the some rice patties, etc., etc., etc. He he walked in the door. We showed him the, the problem. We showed him the suit. And 30 minutes later, he called George Brown and said, "You got to let him out of those damn suits." Well, the thing the thing was, we had the suits all unzipped. Everything it was ridiculous. I mean, there, but uh, you know, another thing about the Gemini Seven mission, I think most people didn't want to fly it, was because it was a medical mission. Let's face it, people wanted to make certain that you, that human beings could last for two weeks in zero g. So for about two weeks before the flight, we had to uh, do what was called a calcium balance experiment or protocol where we had to record everything we ate, everything we excreted, and even take our clothes and send them in so they could see how much calcium we, we gained and lost in that two week period. And then they wanted uh, the doctors, one thing I learned, never trust the doctor any more than you have to because they'll take everything they can get and then some. And they, uh, they wanted me to launch with, uh, is it EEG, where they stick these? EEG, yeah. Yeah, okay, so they stuck needles in my head. I had to go down to MD Anderson and sleep one night with needles in my head to see how compared one we were in space. That didn't bother me, but then, then one of the, the wonders came up with the idea of putting a, a needle in an artery at launch. And I thought, I don't think that sounds too good, too good to me. And we were able to can it, but it was a, it was a fact that Gemini 7 was basically a, a, a human experiment to see how long, how long we would last. Uh, and uh, I, I remember even every doctor was anxious to get something on, uh, maybe they still are, to get an experiment on board. Yeah. They all wanted an experiment. I remember even, you remember Carl Sagan? Sure. The mil billions and billions of... He, he, was, he even had an experiment on Gemini 7 which involved bone density. How the hell he got into that, I don't know. <laughs> but uh -huh. it was, a, it was a, a chore just to keep him away. Uh, <laughs> After this is over, please let me, uh, remind me to tell you what happened when I got Deke Slayton on the pad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let, 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 Kate with, with one, of your, one of your friends, the doctor. Let, 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 me, let me point out, just to follow on what Frank said, the, um, there was always these continuous things of doctors, and one of the big uh, bugaboos they had was called orthostatic hypotension. They were afraid you know, that after zero G had come down, all the blood would run out of your head and your chest cavity down to your legs and you'd have either a stroke or heart attack and all that. So we're having a configuration control there and uh, John Yardley was there and there were some doctors. I was representing the crew and um, 
I, I may have had somebody with me, I don't remember. Else. And so anyway, they wanted to put a hole in the side of the Gemini spacecraft and then have a uh, tube come into the suit and flood the bottom part of the spacesuit. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and a spacesuit, and this way this would have enough pressure that would tend to negate the blood running down. And I looked over Yardley, and, and I'd gotten to know John real well by then, like this. And so he understood completely. And Yardley said, yeah, I think I can do that. <laughs> I looked down, and, he, and so the doctors, oh, they look fine. He says, well, what will it cost? Oh, I think 50 to 70 million dollars. <laughs> so that, that put a stop to that, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it was continual. Well, one of, one of the things we had on Zemini 72 that I didn't mention was they, they, because of the problem that Tom had, had just uh, discussed, they, they put garters on level, pneumatic garters, that would uh, inflate and deflate and on the theory that you would trick your heart into thinking that you were in 1G because it would be more difficult to pump blood out of your extremities. I was a control mission, I didn't control this specimen, I didn't have any garters and I remember we, we got in Gemini and you were in this load and then you popped down on the parachute and I looked at level and I said, well you're going to pass out and he said no and I said, well neither am I and actually it wasn't that big a deal. Our legs were, our legs were were weak because we just like laying in bed for two weeks you didn't hadn't used them but it was uh, that was one of the more exciting things is dealing with some of the people there but uh, they were doing the same thing to me in the emergency room a couple of months ago <laughs> <laughs> uh, any comments on entry uh, Tom or uh, well, Frank on flying the or, or, uh, the Gemini down well, it was just like flying an ILS. As, as uh, Tom mentioned earlier, there we had needles, but the difference, instead of making a, a two or three degree correction, uh, like you would an ILS, you're making a 180 degree uh, correction, rolling up and uh, yeah, like that, yeah. rapidly back and forth. Right, well, the, uh, the Gemini, we had the, uh, this ballast where the center of gravity was offset from the center of pressure, the, the geometric center of the heat shield. And so we had a little bit of lift. I think our lift coefficient in Gemini was between 0.12 and 0.14. In Apollo, we had moved up to 0.24 to 0.25, so we had about doubled. But in Gemini, we had a new computer load. And um, near the end, you know, I was flying the, the roll bug, you know, back and forth to, what, to match the vector, what the computer had. But near the end, some McDonnell engineer had put in there go full lift vector up to reduce the, the G load on the crew. And we're down to, by then we're down to about three Gs, which was nothing after what we'd been through, you know, in the main part of the hip pulse. And so we're sitting there and, and Gene was hitting the, he had the only readout over there and we were coming around nearly at the same latitude, you know, we're crossing longitudes like mad. And, and finally it said lift vector up and we noticed that uh, the um, that uh, that we could predict somehow we were approaching it too fast or too slow. So we worked out some nomographs. And <coughs> after I had it, I called Captain Hartley, who was on the, the uh, skipper of the Wasp, which which had picked us up before on Gemini Six, and this was in. In June of in 65, in December 65, this was June of 66. I said, Captain, if you can get that big wasp on there and the platform is all right, I think we can fly it down. I can get right near your first wire on the deck. So, and again, you got to remember, all that he had to work with was the HO214 tables and the sextant. He may have had some early Lorian lines. So, the first time you ever saw on live TV was right there coming down was Gemini 9. We were coming into it and level, pardon me, uh, what, uh, basically Gene Cern was hitting it and looking at his charts and he says, Tom, we're going too fast, said split S. So I rolled the lift vector down and, and here the wasp was doing a good job at the aim point. We were right off Bermuda so we had real good accurate tracking from that C-band radar. And uh, so with that, it turned like that and we splashed down and 0.38 nautical miles or about seven football field lengths from where we were. 
Are you sure you were closer than we were? Yeah. <laughs> I want you to know that I didn't do any of that crap and we came in very close. <laughs> Well, hey guys, have any uh, last comments that might have a flavor of, you know, how Gen Gemini prepared us for Apollo? How did the Gemini program and experience prepare us for Apollo? Well, one thing I loved about Gemini, I think Frank may have the same opinion, it, it was a small group of people relatively. We could make fast decisions and it was it was it was real fast. We did ten missions in nineteen months, and, b and basically we had trained the crews in rendezvous and spacewalking. We worked out the uh, problems. Finally, saw started to solve the problems of walking in space and working in space, because we didn't have a clue the way we started out. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so, without Gemini. Apollo, I think, would have been an unmitigated disaster had we gone just straight into it. Absolutely. And uh, you think how much we learned in that one year yeah. in uh, yep. 1965. Yep. And uh, if you look at Apollo, every Apollo commander had been a commander or a pilot in Gemini except one that was Al Shepard with Florian Mercury on Apollo 14. And on those uh, first critical missions, Apollo 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, we had two flown Gemini uh, pilots. Well, in fact, you know, on 10 and 11, we had all three crew members had flown Gemini. On those of them. So it was, uh, Gemini was so critical, and yet it's kind of lost in history right, right now. Right. Well, I think Apollo, the Apollo benefited from Gemini experience also when, when you got the management change and some of the, uh, uh, George Lowe and some of the people that had, and Chris that had more of a, of a, a Gemini background got to make some of the decisions on Apollo. No question about that. If you ever went to an Apollo meeting post pre-George Lowe at Rockwell, you really saw something going on, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Between uh, those two guys right there, the Char Charlie uh, Phelps. Phelps. Frick and uh, oh, fr and uh, their guy, our guy was Charlie Frick, and uh, their guy was uh, Pop. Yeah. Pop, yeah. What a jerk that guy was. <laughs> <laughs> they would stand in the middle of the room and curse each other like sailors. I've never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> and uh, George Lowe came uh, in. Apo and said, Apollo, Goodbye. prior to George Lowe, was a, was a troubled program. Absolutely. There's no way we would have gotten to the moon if we had not had the fire, and that's a hell of a thing to say. But, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. Absolute truth. <coughs> and this guy right here, he he was George Lowe in in Downey, and I guarantee that made it work. George Lowe in, in Houston and Frank Borman in Downey. Well, I have the highest regard for for the, the the leaders of NASA, as I told you. George Lowe was unique in that he wasn't, uh, what should I say, he wasn't as decisive or as pound up, but he was a very brilliant, motivated man. Pro probably the, probably if it hadn't been, and I hate to say this, but if it hadn't been for George Lowe taking over, I don't think we'd ever gotten to the moon, at least in, in the 70s. He, uh, he, was the, he was the greatest listener I believe I've ever known. No question about it. Yeah, you know, well, let me give you an example of what uh, was going on before. We had uh, Joe Shea, who later became a good friend. He wasn't at the time. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> I was backing up as a commander on a Jiminy Apollo, Apollo 7, the first flight. And we didn't have an orbital weight ball. All we had was an inertial ball. And and how you apply the vector depends on the rotating radius vector. So if you're positive grade, you know, say one foot per second here, if you go inertia, you're retrograde 180 degrees later. So you need to know where the local horizontal is. So I went in and talked to, and I had two Gemini missions under my belt, and I went in and talked to, uh, 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 you know, uh, Joe Shea. 
and explained this to him. He said, Stafford, you must learn to think inertial. He basically threw me out of the office. <laughs> so I was so pissed. I went down to see Deacon. I remember I went to see you, Chris. And so we've got to have a, a reference what is local horizontal, because how we apply that vector. Chris agreed, Deke agreed, and all this, and we finally did. We came up with a torquer that torqued the ball so the crew would know, even though the platform was inertial, so the crew would know what it was. And it was four degrees around the Earth, and it was three degrees around the moon. That was, it was, uh, when I was out at, at Downey, I, you know, I was just following George Lowe's instructions, but we, we followed them to the letter. And we, it was amazing how many of uh, the astronauts would come out with their own ideas. John Young was a particular pain in the ass. <laughs> he, he'd come out with a, this and that and the other. Thing. And finally, I just, after running out, I, I told D, I called Deacon, I said, nobody comes out here unless I, I approve. And that's, what, and Deke went along, and that was it. I remember another, another time we were out there, Apollo 8 was, was going to be a heavy uh, after the fire. We, and this was uh, at Apollo 7 too. We, we had to add another de-reefing ring on the parachute. Some of you all in here may have been involved in that. And the parachute people, I think it was Northrop, they all wanted to have a dummy drop to, uh, to test it with the, wasn't it three de-reefings we finally ended up with? Three? Yes. It had never been done before. And uh, the only time I ever saw George Miller, he came out there and looked at this and said, no, we don't need to do that. And I said, well, look, Dr. Miller, everybody here thinks we ought to do it. And he said, well, we're not going to do it because it costs too much money. I was upset, let's put it that way. So I called George Lowe. He said, don't worry, Frank, we'll get it done. And we did. <laughs> It was a wonderful man. Tiles, by the way, I could tell you a similar story about the tiles. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, we sound like old farts, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Phil, do you have some questions? No, we weren't able to uh, to get the cards out for folks all the time. Um, if you're willing to take live questions, uh, we can entertain a couple of people. So, for the audience, uh, we do have microphones that folks would like to ask questions. I would like to ask you to sort of contain the content of those questions to, to well-defined questions, technical or about the experience of the president, you know, maybe policy questions right here to talk about those things. I'll come back here and we'll stand by for one second. Uh, we'll get that ready for you. Okay. Now what are we going to do? Somebody's going to have to interpret it for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen you in a long time. It's good yeah. to see you. Good to see you. God bless. I'm hoping not. The only, the only concern, I'm planning on it, but I, I have seen Good morning. I'm uh, Dave Dana Miller. Uh, thank you all for being here today. This has been very uh, instructive and fun. Uh, my question relates to uh, the dynamics between the astronaut core, the pilot community, and the uh, sort of the computer and orbital mechanics geeks and MPAD. Can you talk about the dynamic there? Uh, I think the astronaut core had a lot of, just give me a stick and I'll fly it, and MPAD had the orbital mechanics folks. How did you guys work together? What kind of dynamics was there between those communities? Go ahead, Tim. What was the question? Okay, on the on the dynamics of the computer and the interface. No, he's the dynamics of the people, Tom. How, how, did, how did you together? Is they knew Bill Kendall. Yeah. 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 But we had to. Yeah. I want to say this. I to, in answer your question before you answer, they knew Bill Tyndall. Yeah. <laughs> For whom we had the highest regard, at least I did. <laughs> yes. Right. Bill Tindall managed the trajectory and operation. The whole, that whole group the that, that he put together. Yeah. Trajectory analysis group. The uh, one, one thing, as I pointed out, we had uh, 4,036 addresses in the Gemini computer. Yet, uh, we had to be so disciplined in our software that we could do rendezvous, we could do maneuvers in space that keep track of the orbit, and uh, precise guidance and reentry, but also 
the commander could throw a switch and it could take over and guide the Titan into orbit. All that for 4,096 words. And now, if you look at the modern day computer, the laptop, you know, it takes a couple of gigs to boot up and do that. <laughs> so we, as far as software discipline, it's gotten very loose compared to the old days. And to me, it's one of the weak points in, in, in all types of things from not only space flight, but aircraft, everything else. Yeah. Uh, for Glenn and Chris, maybe you could talk just a second about the Mission Control Center. The only time, I guess, in our history where we've had Ficker 1 and Ficker 2 utilized for manned space flight at the same time. How were the uh, ground assets, the tracking assets, and then the real-time computer complex on the first floor shared, especially during the rendezvous and proximity operations time frame? Do you remember, Chris? I don't, I don't know how they shared the... Uh, resources downstairs, the computer resources. I don't know how they did that. But, I, I mean, in answer to your question, it was sort of like we did whatever it is we had to do. Uh, uh, we've talked about this before, but but we, we used to have a problem with knowing when to cut off the changes and the new capabilities that wanted to be put into the software. Because we we're always very uh, energetic in thinking up new things to put in the machine. And the problem always was, the more we stuffed that stuff in, the later the software settled down and was reliable. And so we were constantly dealing with what a good idea this would be on the front end to, my God, we just basically got a delivery you know, a week or two days before the launch. And we got to do better than that. We have to freeze it. So we struggle with that an awful lot. And uh, we lived in an era of kilobits for all you guys with your cell phones. We lived in an era of kilobits. And uh, they were painfully installed in computers. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a constraint on the program. On the other hand, it probably was good because it didn't allow us to try to put everything under the sun into the, the little, small, kilobit machines that we had. Well, Apollo had the same problem. Every pilot wants everything, and the software was way behind until you, you ran a software control board. That's right. And after that, what did it take? About a month? Things, 30 things, days. 30 days. Everything got squared away. There were a lot of irritated pilots, but uh, it worked. Well, I, I, you have that happen. George O called me and he said, I, gotta, I can't get the software out of MIT. And he said, I want you to go up there and take a look at it. So Bill Tyndall and I went together, and we looked. I was up there for 30 seconds, and I found out what the problem was. They were listening to everybody's changes. And it, you just never got it. And they, they never had a square one to go back to, get that software back to. And I said, when I came back to Houston, Bill and I talked it over, I said, let's, let's have a, a board here, and we'll, we, I don't know anything about software, but from now on, I got to sign off on every damn change it made. Thirty days later, we had more damn software coming out of MIT we could shake a stick at. Yeah, let me bring one thing up on the software. Um, uh, as George Lowe was getting things organized after the fire, and the problem was uh, it wasn't logical that what we had in the software, particularly the block one and all this. So he called Pete Conrad and I, and he told me, I'm in charge, Pete's my deputy, so I want you to go up and live at MIT. So Conrad and I would fly in a T-38 every week to MIT, leave on Sunday night or early Monday morning, go and land at Logan Airport, which they had a hotel right down the street from MIT, and they'd hate to see us coming, because some of the MIT scientists wanted to have, take it in various th ways, we said, no, this is what we need for them. So there's just too much. You could wear down your finger punching the buttons for what they wanted. And so Conrad and I spent over, well over a month. That, that was probably in October of 67. You know, one of the things that's interesting, speaking of MIT, they, uh, they did a great job. But one of the, uh, their requirements at first was we're going to shut down the inertial platform and then re, then re orient it with the stars and what's on. My idea is, well, if you got something running and it's running well, leave it alone. Don't shut the damn thing down. So I wrote a, a letter to, uh, I guess, George Lowe, and he sent it to MIT, and the MIT defendant came back 
it was written by an engineer with a, a long letter why it should be shut down, why it could be shut down, and why it'll work if you shut it down. He signed it, and on the PS, I wish I'd have kept this letter. He said, if I were going on this mission, I'd let the damn thing run off. <laughs> That's a true story. And as far as I know, it ran the whole time on all the missions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. They did a great job, though. Yeah. Is there another question? What did it feel like to launch on a Titan? And when the mission was over, what did a splashdown feel like? Well, <coughs> splashdown is, is... Have you ever made a parachute jump? Well, the splice down is like a, depends how the wind's blowing. And in Jiminy Six, I came down with Wally. It was just, a, it was very calm, just a plop. On Jiminy Nine, the wind was blowing real strong, and we hit the lee side of a wave, and that's when you saw it live on TV. A column of water went up about 40 or 50 feet in the air. We went underwater, ripped some shingles off the bottom of the spacecraft, a little water came in through the pressurization valve, and I saw stars for just a second, man. It was a real cruncher. And then um, coming back from the moon on Apollo 10, it was very calm in the Pacific Ocean, and we just barely plopped down, and that was it. On Apollo Soyuz, it was the same way as Gemini 9. The wind was blowing strong. We hit down with a real crunch on the lee side of a wave, probably at least a 10G pulse, and flipped inverted to stable two with a negative 6G pulse. And we had to turn on the airbags to get back. So every one was different depending upon yeah, the I, wind. The structure of design load for Apollo was a, a 15 knot wind into a 15 foot wave. Yeah. That was a design load, structural design load for that spacecraft. It wasn't anything to do with flying in space. Yeah. It was hitting that damn wall yeah. wave. Yeah, we, on Gemini 7, our experience was like yours on, on the Gemini. It was a soft landing. But on Apollo 8, we really hit. And I still don't know if anybody knows for sure, but I got inundated with water. And uh, we got flipped over, too. I, I think they finally determined that the water had come from the environmental control system and kept it cool. But uh, it was a, a whack on, on Apollo 8. Well, well Phil, do you have anything else? Uh, honeycomb sponge in the, in, the, in the struts. Yeah. We had yeah. to add those to prevent damage to the astronaut's body. Yeah. So that was the design load. There was no question about it. I don't know whether Dr. Kraft would want to talk about this, <laughs> but I, during this fabulous eight weeks that we worked this mission, he and Paul Haney were flying to Florida for and something very unusual happened. I don't know what, whether he wants to talk. Because he was basically a hero. Or, could Dr. Kraft, can you talk about? What? I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Ken. Ken. I, what, what, did you, what are you asking? Okay. I was just going to see if you wanted to mention your experience on the National Airlines to Florida for Gemini, uh, Gemini oh. meeting you and Doc, uh, Paul Haney. I think that was I remarkable. I, I know what you mean, yeah. I, I didn't like that experience. <laughs> what did you say? He didn't like it. He hadn't told you why. Well, I, I, uh, Paul Haney, I got on the airplane in Houston and they, uh, they did a great thing for us. They put us in first class. Me and Paul Haney, and well, when we got to, we ran flying through through from here to New Orleans, got and then took off from New Orleans, and the, the uh, <coughs> uh, flight attendant came by to me and said, "I have this young man in the back of the airplane. And he's feigning, feigning sickness, uh, and he's got a bag in his hand, and we're concerned about what he might have in there. Would you?" Uh, I'm going to bring him up and sit him next to you in this seat, and uh, would you engage him and see what you can't do something about like that? <laughs> I said, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> Smart-ass craft, you know. So this guy, this kid comes up and sits down next to me, 
And uh, I, I point out, ask him, what do you got in the bag? <laughs> Zap, out came this pistol. It looked like a cannon. And I heard this click. And I swear to God, it, the, the hammer went off. And uh, I could see, I said, well, isn't this a hell of a way to die? <laughs> Is that what you were talking about? <laughs> well, he didn't and I, die. you know, he was he was firing bullet uh, after we he he got in front of us. He was firing the gun down into the floor, and I thought it, it, I didn't see anything in the floor. You know, you don't you, you, carpet, you know, on the on the front of that DC-8, and I didn't see the, any holes there, so I figured he was f firing blanks. When we got back to New Orleans. And they pull that carpet up, all I could see would it looked like somebody had riveted holes in the damn floor, you know, where well, all those bullets went through into the into the Yeah. They were real bullets. Yeah, they were real bullets. I hadn't heard that one before. Thank God thank God I didn't know there were bullets at the time. I'd have probably died from heart failure. <laughs> was asked to uh, to relay a question for the long duration mission um, being this was sort of one of the pioneering long duration flights and ultimately that's what we wound up doing a lot of what kind of operational things were you asked to do during the mission uh, you know dietary things low low solids diets and that sort of thing can you talk just a little bit about that I guess so. I can't hear you I can't hear you come on come up I'm oh, sorry you, you come up here hear. and talk to us please yeah. we can, we can. Yeah, they, they Tom and I both have trouble hearing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is uh, for the long duration mission since, uh, since the Gemini 7 was the first long duration flight. What kind of operational things did they have you do in order to get through those 14 days? Low solids, diets, that sort of thing. Well, we went through the, the uh, calcium balance before the mission, the calcium balance after the mission, and our food was, I think, the same food that everybody ate on Gemini, wasn't it? It was... Uh, you just squirted water in a plastic bag, mixed it up, and ate it. It was terrible, uh, but it kept us alive. And I, uh, I don't know. They probably have much better food now. As a matter of fact, uh, on Apollo, they got better no food. food. Uh, they put uh, some kind of a wet pack in, but Sky, I, I, I Skylab wanna... had the best food. What's that? Skylab had the best food. Okay. Well, and we actually had a heat, heating plate, uh, special receptacles for the food. You could have, you, you know, we had a freezer, and we had meat locker, et cetera, et cetera. E eating wasn't the problem. Getting rid of it was the problem. <laughs> especially, especially in the Gemini, uh, we had a, we had like, looked like a top hat with, with stickiness on it to, uh, for excrement, and then you just urinated into a, a, a condom and then, then dumped it overboard. Mm -hmm. You know, that, it was the number two thing that was the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that a glove. <laughs> Describe the glove. You had a glove to defecate in. Yeah. Well, it was like, you know what I'm saying, it was, it was like a top hat, really. Right. It, was a, it was a mess, but uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think Jim Lovell aptly described it. He said it was like flying two weeks in a men's room. That's, <laughs> what, uh, that's what he said. <laughs> But you were only up there 19 hours. <laughs> well, well all, almost all the crew up until uh, really uh, uh, Gemini 5 went on a low residue diet done. before they before they flew. They they really didn't have to defecate. Uh, they did it with very little. So after you got past that, you know, for a long duration time. It was it was pretty bad. I mean, it was very difficult to live in a in a spacecraft like Gemini, particularly. You can imagine you got your fanny in the other guy's face. But you can imagine that. Yeah, let me bring up one thing. <clears throat> well, Apollo was ten. <clears throat> uh, we call it the first UFO. And uh, no, <coughs> Gemini seven was the first UFO. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anyway, the low residue diet, and then you'd take a laxative, then you'd take Lomatil or something to lock up. So, and the food we ate was low residue, so you wouldn't have a bowel movement for four or five days. 
And uh, <coughs> so we had gone to the moon and we'd separated in the lunar module, gone down the two passes, came back, picked out the landing ellipse, came back, rendezvoused and stay there, then have about one more day to track, to pick, try to really nail down the lunar landmarks and surface. And about that time, all three of us finally had to go to uh, have a bowel movement. And it was dark, and we were also trying to get some sleep. And it was kind of smelly around and all that. And anyway, all, so anyway, next day was going to be the day we are going to come home. And <clears throat> I'm flying the spacecraft local horizontal like that, and looking up at the landmarks on the chart. John Young had a patch over one eye. He was looking to track on the, the mark. And Cernan was there, was shooting stereo with the Hasselblad camera. And we'd do, do four marks, and we'd roll upside down, dump the data to the Earth. John would align the platform on three stars, pitch over, and keep going. And I'm flying, <clears throat> and suddenly I see something come up, up my right eye at me. I look at it, and I duck, and I said, hey, which one of you bastards did that? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? Tom, I said, hey, do you know what just came past me? And I said, what do you mean? And of course, in the spacecraft with air currents, things can get lost. And, and, and suddenly, Cernan said, uh-oh, here it comes. So we had, we had to get a control of the situation. So everybody get, you know, some Kleenex, you know, some wipes out. And we finally captured it. And, and then we put it in the, in the waste bag. But this was before the days of DNA, so it was unknown as far as, <laughs> as, as, as uh, you know. You, 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 you're not telling the real story about John Young. In on uh, on the, the flight, one of the flights previous to John Young's flight, uh, we found that the body saves calcium but it does not save potassium and that's very bad on, in your blood as you well know if you get in the hospital they want to make sure that you got the right potassium content in your blood well the doctor said we'll fix that so they they laced everything with orange juice lost potassium and and, and that full of potassium and the first thing they did when they got into orbit was have diarrhea. <laughs> and if you don't think that wasn't a mess, <laughs> it sure in hell was. Well, I was hoping you guys could end on a high point. <laughs> <laughs> they asked the question. But last oh, yeah. call for comments. Anything, Tom? Go ahead. Well, we always had to play a few jokes and... Um, uh, Jiminy six and seven was flowing just about Christmas time. So uh, anyway, this was Wally's idea, and he could play a harmonica. He had a little bitty one, and he said, "Hey, why don't we play? If everything goes right, we'll play a, j a joke on the ground, and we'll play Jingle Bells." Okay. So I had uh, uh, Lola, who was our secretary down there, go get some bells like kids have on their roller skates and all that put on a nylon loop and Wally had a little harmonica and so it was about two revs before retrofire. We're going, you know, blunt in forward and so I was on the right, which is facing through the north. And I called down, I remember Elliot C was Capcom. And I said, uh, Houston, uh, this is Jiminy Six. I've got a light, kind of a bright light coming out of the right from the north. It looks like it's in a descending orbit. It's, it's got motion with respect to the stars, and it looks like it's getting bigger. And I said, the angular bearing rate is, is about constant, which means it could be a collision. And so I kept building this up. I said, in fact, I could think of hear some noise. And I could hear, hear C's voice that said, more, more and more, more, give us more information, all that. And finally, at the right time, we, we were a tracking station we pushed down the mic button, and Wally played jingle bells on the harmonica, and I rang the jingle bells. <laughs> and so you can see it at the Smithsonian up on the second floor in the apartment. UFO. Well, we played one more thing, too. 
we were sitting around crew quarters, and Jiminy Seven was already up. And uh, we, you know, we were, Wally and I were super trained to do the rendezvous. And uh, there were three Naval Academy grads: Al Shepard, Sh Wally Shira, and myself. And it's about the time of the Army Navy game, and so he said, "Hey, we ought to do something for the mids, midshipmen." And he said, "Why don't we put a sign so so we could have Lovell take a picture? It'd be the first time so I could take a picture of another spacecraft." Right? So we had again, uh, and so I said, well, what about Go Navy, something? So Shepard came up with the idea and said, beat Army. And so we had Lola cut us out a blue piece of cardboard and put gold letters on it, beat Army. And so as we'd been up there for a while, everything was going good after about an hour. And uh, I told Jim, I said, say the doctors are concerned about you. You've been up here longer than anybody. They're worried about your vestibular function. and." Uh, I want you to, I'll, I'll hold up this uh, letters and you t call it out and take a picture. And I held it up, but Frank saw it first and he reversed it. He says, beat Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but, 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 but Lovell took the picture and it was so unique. I, I think two days later, it was, I got down, it was on the front page of the Washington Post. That's because they were only up there 19 hours, so they got back there. <laughs> Well, folks, there you are. Uh, what a hand for our guests. If everyone would sit down for just one second, um, I would like to ask everyone in the room who was directly involved with the Gemini 7 and Gemini 6 missions, if you would please stand up. So to yourselves and to our distinguished panel, um, my personal thanks as somebody who spent their career in the program that you guys set the foundation for. Thank you for your service to the country and to the agency and to humanity for the cause of human space flight. Everybody, thank you very much for attending for the day. If, if those of you that supported Gemini 6 and 7 would, would come on up forward here, we might try to get a photograph.